Good morning, BCC family. Happy Sunday morning. I'm so glad that you have joined us. I'm so glad that you have taken a time out of your week uh, to be here um, and to worship with us, uh, although not together, uh, worship together uh, in spirit. Uh, it is still very weird having a Sunday morning service with, with no one in the building. Uh, it is very weird not having us all together where we can shake hands and hug and, and be together in a physical sense. Uh, but until all of this is over, we'll just continue doing uh, what we can do and the best that we can do. Uh, so we're going to continue going through on our Facebook videos. Uh, this week is going to be a little bit different though. Uh, we're pre-recording this service. Uh, for the last few weeks, we have been streaming live uh, to where, you know, you know, if we're up on stage, you know, we're there in real time uh, coming through your TV that way. Uh, this is going to be a pre-recorded service and then we're just going to upload that to Facebook uh, and go that way. Uh, last week, the feed went down halfway through the service uh, and, we, and Nick got it back up, up and running and everything was good uh, but we know this way the feed won't go down and, and hopefully this will just make everything more enjoyable hopefully it'll make it easier uh, for you guys to watch um, another thing that we're switching up this morning is uh, I am not leading worship uh, for the last few months I've been working with Phyllis Mullins uh, on getting her and Michael out to lead worship for us uh, in person uh, and, and they were supposed to come a week in June when we were in Florida for CIY move um, but with all of this going on with with all of the COVID stuff I, I sent her a text and said hey would you guys be willing to uh, record something and, and uh, lead us to the uh, throne of God and worship through that. Uh, so they have done that and uh, we're going to jump into worship uh, with them. So this is going to be a fantastic thing. So I'm going to kick it over to Phyllis and Michael uh, and also one of Phyllis's granddaughters is in there too. Uh, so they're going to lead us in worship. Uh, but before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you've given to us. And we're so thankful that even though we are separate, even though we are uh, not in the same building, we come together in one spirit. Uh, we pray that you will be with this worship hour. We pray that we can worship you. We pray that we can come before you, uh, come before your throne and lift up an offering, a fragrant offering to you. Well, we love you and we are yours. And it is in your son's name we pray. Amen. Before we get into worship, I would like to ask you to hit that share button, uh, create a watch party. Uh, that way this can get out to as many people as possible. This is absolutely the easiest way you have ever had to uh, invite people to church, uh, just to hit that share button and it gets out to that. So uh, enjoy worship. Um, I pray that you will worship uh, and lift God up through this. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, You've been hearing the same old voice of the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run the things we know just stay right. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking savior and you got chains. He's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. Oh, if you believe receive it if you can feel it somebody testify testify yeah. if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody
somebody testify if you got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way maker if you need freedom or save it he's a prison shaking savior if you got pain he's a chain breaker If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessing be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to sing. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name. On the road marked with suffering, though this pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to sing. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures, hear me low. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, 
Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, no place to begin. mercy come in when death was arrested my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphaned heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my fear Oh, your grace, so free, 
washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with you. Sing, we're free, yes, we're free, free forever. We're free. So come join the song of all the routine. So free, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now, life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down. us new. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. One more time. You have made us new. Now life begins with
All right, so like I said before, we are switching it up uh, a little bit this week. Uh, not only are we pre-recording the service and not you know, officially being live, um, we also had the Mullins family just uh, get done leading this worship there. And, and thank you so much to them. Uh, just such a blessing uh, for them to do that for us. Uh, so, so I want to thank you guys again. Uh, and not only are we switching up with those two things, uh, we're also switching up. As, as you can see, I am not in the building. Uh, I am actually uh, preaching from uh, our backyard. Uh, so, so this is where I am. Uh, and if you'll notice, I got on a sweater because another thing that changed was the weather uh, it is a little chilly uh, a little chilly although the Sun did come out a little bit ago uh, and, it, and it's warmer than it was but uh, one more thing that we're switching up this week is uh, we are starting a brand new uh, sermon series uh, we just finished our uh, empty to be filled service uh, series uh, with our Easter service last week uh, where we looked at uh, things that we need to be emptied of and then filled with um, this morning we are starting a new series uh, that is entitled dangerous prayers um, these prayers are prayers that we're going to look at from the Bible that are are dangerous for us to prayer uh, to, to pray. Not in a, a, a dangerous like a physical sense. Not like, dear God, please let me get hit by a bus or let me almost get hit by a bus. Not like that. Um, but these are prayers that will take us out of our comfort zone, take us away uh, from being comfortable in our faith. Uh, you know, and from a physical standpoint, being comfortable um, isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, think about you're going to buy a new couch and you go to a furniture store uh, back before furniture stores were closed uh, when you would go to a furniture store and you would you would sit on all of the couches and, and you would you would test all of the individual couches and put your feet up and and, and look at all of the things uh, it would be really weird if you would go at, to the sales rep and say hey look you know I just I sat on every single couch you have uh, this is the one I want this is the most uncomfortable couch I've ever sat on in my entire life uh, this is the one I want you know let's let's start the paperwork no you wouldn't do that you would find the couch that's the most comfortable and, and that's the one that you would buy uh, when we were growing up, we had legitimately the most uncomfortable couch uh, throughout all of history. It had to have been marketed that way. It, it had to have had a sign saying, most uncomfortable thing in the entire world, uh, please buy this. Uh, we grew up in a house in the Portland neighborhood over in Louisville, uh, and, it, and it was an old steamboat captain's house, and you know, just a beautiful house, you know, hardwood floors, fireplaces, crown molding, you know, 16 foot ceiling, just beautiful house. Um, but in the front room, we had a front room, and it was a front living room, and my parents decided they wanted to make it a formal uh, living room. So they went and, you know, they would have grandfather clock and this kind of stuff. Well, they bought this couch that was like this Victorian couch, you know, had this, you know, wooden thing on the top of it that was carved and real ornate looking. It was literally the most uncomfortable thing you have ever sat on in your entire life. But, but we weren't allowed to sit on it, you know, especially as kids. You know, we weren't allowed to go anywhere near it, um, you know, except for Christmas. That's like the only time we were allowed to sit on it because that's, you know, where we do a majority of our stuff. Uh, but we didn't want to sit on that couch uh, because it was like I said I mean it was like sitting on a wrought iron uh, uh, park bench it was it was awful uh, but as much as being comfortable uh, is important when it comes to a physical sense um, when it comes to a spiritual sense um, being comfortable is a bad thing um, being comfortable can become an enemy uh, to our spiritual selves uh, be, becoming comfortable um, can be something that stops us from growing uh, comfort can lead to complacency, and complacency can lead to apathy, and, and apathy can lead us to a place where we are indifferent uh, to God and, and our faith. Uh, so comfort is the enemy of, of the Christian life. Comfort is the enemy of those who are trying to be spiritually fit. Comfort is the enemy of those who are trying to grow uh, in their faith. So for in order for us to get out of our comfort zone, in order for us uh, to leave a place where we are comfortable, uh, we have to pray uh, these dangerous prayers uh, that are in the Bible. Um, these prayers will get us out of that uh, and lead us to a place uh, where we can grow. Because let's be real, we cannot grow uh, when we're comfortable. You know, just like you can't get into good shape if you're lounging on a comfortable couch, uh, you cannot grow in your spiritual self if you are in a place where you are just constantly comfortable. We have to get out of that comfort zone. Uh, we have to pray these dangerous prayers. We grow through praying these prayers. This morning, we're going to look at a prayer uh, from, from David. Uh, from the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 139. And this is a super famous psalm. I, I know a lot of people, this is their favorite psalm. Uh, and it is just a gorgeous psalm that shows how much God knows us and how much he loves us and how much, uh, you know, he intimately knows us on every level. Uh, but the last couple verses of this psalm uh, is, is David opening himself up to God, saying, God, I want you to come in and, and search every bit of me and look and, 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 and just completely dissect everything that's within me uh, so that you can know 
know where I am and so that I can see what you see inside of me. Uh, these last couple verses, um, it, it, is, it is David breaking down the walls uh, that, are, that he has built inside his heart and allowing God to come in and see those things. These are the last two verses of this great psalm, verses 23 and 24. This is what David says. He says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there are any grievous ways in me, and lead me in the ways of everlasting. This is a dangerous prayer right here. This is a dangerous prayer. This is a prayer that will take us out of our comfort zone. It is very uncomfortable for us to open ourselves up to the God of the universe, the, the, the God who created everything, the God who created even us. It is, it is very uncomfortable for us to open ourselves up to God and say, search me. Search me and know my heart and test my thoughts, test my will, test everything inside of me. And if you see something in me that is grievous, you see anything in me that is out of your will, uh, show it to me and lead me in the ways uh, of everlasting. Man, this is a dangerous prayer. He says, search me and know my heart. Uh, this word that David uses uh, for heart, uh, it's not just you know talking about like our actual heart, um, and it's not just talking about what we view now as our heart, like I'll love you with all my heart. Uh, it literally means every part of our being, inside and out. Uh, this is you know where our thoughts come from, where our feelings come from, where our motives, our dreams, our wills, where everything in our lives comes from. Every part of our being could be summed up uh, by talking about our heart. So he says, know my heart. He says, know everything about me. This is asking God to come in and give a full inspection on our lives. This is asking God to come in and open up everything and see every teeny tiny little bit. This is not us asking God to come and just drive by our house and look at the front of our house and our landscaping and check out the curb appeal of our house and give a report on that. This is not just asking us asking God to come in uh, to the living room or the kitchen or the dining room and just kind of look around and give us a report on that. This is us asking God to come into our house and to come in and open up all the doors and open up all the cabinets, open up all the drawers, open up all the closets. This is us saying, now come into our bedroom, open up our closet bedroom, open up the master bathroom, uh, you know, the, the closets, open up the cabinets, look everywhere, go through every tiny little thing. Through this, we are even inviting God to open up our junk drawer uh, and, and to rummage through our junk drawer and see what's in there. Because you know every house has a junk drawer. Every house has a junk drawer. Uh, you know, we, the, the phone drunk, junk drawer, you know, is, is full of a bunch of stuff. But if you need, if you need some, some paper clips, some rubber bands, um, a, a basketball uh, pump and needle, if you need anything along those lines at all, you need a chip clip, you need a deck of cards, uh, a Sharpie, a pen, a pencil, a pencil sharpener, a quarter, anything like that, you're going to the junk drawer. Because that's where we all keep it. We keep that stuff in the junk drawer. Uh, the house I grew up in, uh, the one down in Portland, we had this thing called the old counter that was like our junk space. Uh, and I don't know why we called it an, an old counter. Um, maybe because it was original to the house. I really don't know. Uh, but it had two junk drawers and then like this cabinet underneath and then these shelves above it that you had to stand on uh, the cabinet or stand on the counter to get up to the top of the cabinet. Uh, it was just this crazy thing, but it was just, you know, and it was all full of junk. But if we needed something, you know, that's where we went. You know, if we needed a screw and screwdriver, it was going to be in there. If you needed a staple or a stapler, it was going to be in there. Uh, that's where everything was, you know, that it was in that junk drawer. Uh, but we all have that junk drawer. And when we look at this prayer that David prayed uh, here in Psalm 139, uh, we see him saying, God, come in. Come in and search me and know my heart. He says, come in and inspect every little bit. Don't just stop at the surface. Come and search everything. Uh, when, we, when we pray this prayer to God, we are giving him the keys to every single room. You know, there are times when we um, try to keep our hearts off limits to God. We try to keep portions of our heart off limits to God. It's just the same like if someone's coming to our house uh, to visit. You know, we clean the living room and the kitchen and the dining room and, and, and the hallway bathroom, but we don't really clean up the bedrooms too much. We don't clean up the master bath too much because we don't. We're, we're not expecting people to go back in there. Uh, we kind of do the same thing to God. Uh, we, you know, we open up the part of our heart that's labeled religion or, or labeled church or, or labeled faith. We open that part to God because we want. God to come into that. You know, we open up parts of our, our uh, um, heart labeled family or, or labeled uh, health and safety and wellness. We let God in that because we want him to keep us safe. We want him to keep our, our relationships uh, good. We want him to keep our family safe. 
But a lot of times we push God out of things like finance or, or work or hobbies. Uh, we definitely want to keep him out of the part of our heart where we keep that sin uh, buried deep in there. And what we do, what we try to do is we try to keep those, those things secret from God. We try to hide uh, those parts from God. But when we read what David's, we read David's prayer and we read what he says, it goes against all of that. He says, God, I'm fully open up to you. I want you to be able to see everything that's in here. I want you to come in and search me. This is like the FBI coming with a, with a search warrant that they can get into every single little piece. We're asking God to come and open everything up and to search into everything and highlight what is wrong. Now, obviously, God knows everything. God knows your heart. God, you, you know, we think that we can hide stuff from God, which is just so ridiculous. But we try to do it, and we, we do it all the time. Uh, but, but God already knows us on a deep and intimate basis. Uh, this, look, just listen to the first 12 verses of Psalm 139 of, of what David says. He says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you knew it all. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell at the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness shall overcome me and the light about me to be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day for darkness is as light within you. Now, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing uh, that David wrote there. He's like, God knows us and knows us on the deepest, most intimate levels. He knows the deep recesses of our heart and our soul. He knows our thoughts, our desires, our motives. He knows every little uh, thing about us. He knows more about us than we could ever imagine than he knows. He knows more about us than we could ever imagine that we ourselves uh, know about us. He knows everything. He knows the number of the hairs on top of our head uh, or on our face. Uh, even, you know, everybody knows the number of hairs I have. Uh, but but the, the difference is with David's prayer at the end of Psalm 139 is he is welcoming God to come in. It is an attitude of vulnerability. It's an attitude of humility. It's an attitude of submission to God. This is David asking God to come in and, and search him and know his heart and, and, and look at his thoughts and show him where he is wrong. God knows. God knows all this stuff. But this is David asking God to know this and to show him. He says, show me where I'm not in line with your will. Because here's the deal, uh, as human beings, we are naturally going to be outside of the will of God. We are naturally um, going to be um, uh, going opposite to His will. Our will is not going to align with God's will. Our heart is not going to align with God's heart. Uh, as human beings in our sinful nature, we push God away. We push God's ways away from us. That's why we need God to come in and inspect our hearts so we can see where we are out of line. Look what the 17th chapter of Jeremiah uh, says about the human heart. This is from Jeremiah 17, uh, 9 through 11. He says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets rich, but not by justice. In the midst of his days they will leave him, and in his end he will be a fool. So it says the heart is deceitful. He says this heart is deceitful and it leads us in a way that leads to destruction. He says the heart is desperately sick. Our hearts are desperately sick and they go to the opposite of what God is wanting us to do. We cannot follow God. We cannot come to God naturally on our own. You see, with our sinful nature, we are naturally bent towards sin. We are naturally bent uh, towards doing our own thing. We are naturally bent uh, towards going to the ways of the flesh instead of to the ways of God. So it is critical for the Christian to come to God and say, search me and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Test my will. Test my desires. Test my motives so that I can come and, and see where I am failing so that I can come and be closer to you. But this is a super, a super uncomfortable and a super awkward thing to do. 
It is very awkward for the God of the universe to search us. It is super awkward for the God of the universe, the most powerful being that has ever existed, to come and look inside the deep recesses of our hearts. It is super awkward for us to invite God Almighty to come in and do a full check on our hearts. It's super awkward because we know what he's going to find. It's super awkward and super painful and super uncomfortable because we know that the sin that we hide inside our heart, we know that the brokenness uh, that's inside our heart, we know the depravity that lives inside our heart, and it is super awkward for us to say, God, please come and inspect this. Please come and look at this heart and put a spotlight on what I need to change. Show me uh, what needs to go. Because there is an impurity that lives within our hearts uh, that is pushing us away from God, that is pushing us away from the Holy Spirit. So many times because of the impurity in our hearts, we neglect the call that God has put on our lives. We have a mission and we have a job. We are not living to the full potential that God has called us to uh, because of the filth that is inside our hearts. Think about it this way, uh, if, if, if inside your heart you have, you have this self-centered pride and you are selfish and you are always thinking about yourself and you have promoted yourself to the king or queen of the throne of your heart, uh, the last thing that you're going to do is look out for and love other people. You're going to constantly be putting yourself first and pushing them behind you uh, to where you are uh, given glory in, instead of them, to where you are given glory instead of God, and it shouldn't be that way. So we have to say, God, test my heart just so that you can show me this selfishness and this pride that's inside my heart so that I can get rid of it. Another example, uh, that if our heart is, is filled with the, the simple desires of our flesh and the lust of our flesh, man, that's uncomfortable to talk about, isn't it? If we give in to those desires uh, and we look at things on the internet that we shouldn't look at or, or look at things that we shouldn't enter into relationships that we shouldn't be entering into, that breaks our marriages, that breaks our family, that this biblical marriage that we should have is completely taken and defiled and, and thrown on the back burner because of this lust that's in our hearts. And as a result, our relationships are broken. Our relationships with others, with our spouses, with our children, our relationship with God is broken because of that. But if we can say, God, search my heart and, and highlight this lust that's inside of my heart, highlight this, this desire to fulfill my flesh that's inside my heart and take that and get rid of it, and we can come to God. One more, uh, if we have a section in our heart that's off limit, it's to God that, that is our workplace and our job place. And we, you know, when we get to work and we get to, uh, you know, to our jobs and we get to our coworkers, we, we push God away and we're like, no, we're going to do this. We're going to uh, do this on our own. We're not going to let God come into this workplace. Then we will, we will push other people around. We won't treat people the way that we're supposed to treat them. And, and we will forever be stepping on them and stepping over them and knocking them off the ladder so we can get higher and higher. Uh, we enter into relationships relationships that are impure at our workplace because we've taken God and pushed him out of this workplace. So we have to open up and say, God, search my heart. Search my heart and show me the impurities that are within my heart so that you can fill me more so that I can be a, a greater cause for the gospel. You see, if we don't invite God into our hearts uh, to search our hearts, to investigate our motives, then we will continue to have misplaced desires. We will continue to have uh, misplaced motives. We will continue to have misplaced wills uh, that will go contrary to what he wants us to do. Uh, the writer of Hebrews uh, said it perfectly when he talked, uh, when he spoke about the heart in, in Hebrews 4, is what he said. He says, For the word of God is living and active, a, sh a sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who we must give an account. Boy, if you thought it was awkward to ask God to come, and just search your heart, it is really awkward to stand before him naked and exposed. The writer of Hebrews says that, that the word of God is active, it is living, that it is like a sharp, double-edged sword. He says it will come in and divide you apart. He said, because if you've got things inside of your heart uh, that shouldn't be there, the word of God will come in and cut them out for you. He says that we'll come and stand before God exposed and naked. That's open right there. 
That's uncomfortable right there. That's awkward right there. That's vulnerable right there. This thought of us standing before God uh, naked gives us this sense of vulnerability. And, and that's what David's talking about through this prayer is coming before God and be vulnerable. We have to open up to God uh, and be vulnerable. But this vulnerability is awkward. It is uncomfortable. The last thing that I want to do, the last thing that I want to do is stand naked before anybody, ever, ever. But especially now that we've been in this quarantine and I've had nothing to do but sit and eat food for the last four weeks. You know, I, I joked about it being colder and me wearing a sweater, uh, you know, but another reason I'm wearing a sweater is to cover up the quarantine 20 uh, that I've gained over this last month. The last thing I want to do is stand naked before anybody. I want to put on as many clothes as possible uh, so that I look better because when we stand there naked, we're fully exposed. All of our flaws are showing. All of our impurities are showing. But the writer of Hebrews says that we're going to stand there with all of our flaws there for God to see. And that's what David's talking about. He says, search my heart, O God. Know me. Judge my thoughts. Shine a light on what is wrong in there. Because this is what's going to happen, is when we can come to a place where we can pray this prayer uh, that, that David uh, modeled for us, to search me, O God, and know my heart. If we can pray that and truly mean that, that's going to bring up a lot of stuff. That's going to bring up some guilt and shame because we know the impurity that's in our heart. We know the brokenness that's in our heart. We know we can never measure up to God. We know that we can never uh, live a way, live in such a way that we can always please God. So there's guilt and shame that comes from that. But here's the good news, is that Jesus came. Jesus came and died on a cross to take away the sin and the shame that is inside our hearts. Jesus came to redeem us and forgive us and to bring us back to God. Jesus died so that we could stand fully open before God with all of our mess, with all of our um, impurities, with all of our sin, with all of our shame, and stand before God and say, God, take this and remove this from me. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for those misplaced motives in your heart. Jesus died for that impurity in your heart. Jesus died for the, the lust of the flesh that we carry around inside our hearts. After David had sinned with Bathsheba and, and, and killed her husband uh, to cover it up, he knew that what he did was wrong. He knew that his heart uh, was crooked. He knew that what he did uh, was the worst of the worst. And he knew that he had to make it right going forward. Uh, listen to the words of his prayer after this sin from Psalm 51. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold with me a willing spirit. This is the attitude that we have to come to God with after he has searched us. Because after he searches us, we're going to know that we have a heart that is not where it should be, a heart that is not clean. So after we've been searched and after God shows us the impurities of our heart, we have to come in him and say, God, please create in me a clean heart. Please renew in me a what is right and what is good. But this is only after that he has come in and searched us. This is only after he has um, shown us what is wrong within our own hearts. Because I know that you, just like me, our hearts are not pure all of the time. Our motives are not pure all of the time. There are times when we are selfish. There are times when we're prideful. There are times when we are angry and hateful and spiteful and we have malice in our heart towards other people. There are times when we don't love others the way that we should. There are times when we hold on to these sins that are inside our hearts and we keep them all bundled up. But Jesus came uh, to die for those things. So I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you and urge you to pray this prayer of David. To pray this prayer, to search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. Is your heart filled with selfish pride? Is your heart filled with anger and rage and malice towards other people? 
are the motives that live inside your heart lifting you up instead of lifting God up? Are you the king or queen of the throne on your heart? Are you loving yourself more than you're loving others? Are you loving yourself more than you're loving God? Is there a lust that's inside and a desire that's inside uh, your heart that you're living out on? Is your heart, uh, are you the center of the motives and the dreams go against uh, the, the motives and the dreams of God? Is your heart perfectly aligned with God? Is the will of your heart perfectly aligned with God's will? Are your motives perfectly aligned with God's motives? Are you 100% all in, fully ready to serve God in all things? This is why it is so important for us to stop and say, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Because this prayer, this prayer that we've talked about this morning, this prayer will open up your eyes to those things. This prayer, that if you pray this prayer and you mean this prayer and you take it to God, He will show you the impurities of your heart. He will show you where you're failing. He'll show you where you're doing good too, but He'll show you where you're failing. We have to have a time where we can stop and say, Search me, O oh God and know my heart. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to, to film this teaching time outside uh, and, and where I'm at is it's a pretty peaceful and quiet uh, little place here. It's perfect for stopping and reflecting. It's perfect for allowing God to come and search us. So I want you to take just a moment, just a moment, and pray this prayer. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test my thoughts. Find if there are any grievous ways within me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I encourage you to spend time with God in prayer. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Coming up to a time of communion in our service. And this is a time where we stop and remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we've talked about that this morning already. He took our sin. He took our shame. He took those desires. And he took them to the cross so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be redeemed back to him. But this is also a time where we stop. Where we stop and commune with him where we sit across the table from God and open up our hearts. We say, God, search me. Show me where I'm wrong. Show me where I'm living uh, away from you. And God, please forgive us for those times. We take the bread and the juice or the cracker and the juice, whatever you have at home, and we take these elements remembering the fact that Jesus took all of those sins and shame to the cross so that we could open up and let God take them from us. So in this time of communion, I encourage you to open up and to thank God and remember what Jesus did for his awesome, awesome sacrifice and for God's amazing grace. Let's pray over our communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the ability to come to you and, and be forgiven. We're thankful that you are a God that loves us enough that we can open up our hearts to you and allow you to search us. God, please forgive us for the impurity in our hearts. Please forgive us for the sins that we keep stored up. Forgive us for our pride and for our anger and for our rage and for our selfishness. God, we pray that you will come and search us to know our hearts and to show us where we are out of line uh, when it comes to your will. God, we love you and we are yours. Thank you so much for sending Jesus to the cross. We love you and we are yours. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen.
this morning, if you've uh, watched this service and you have never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, um, I, I lovingly urge you uh, to do that, to start that process. Uh, this is the greatest uh, decision you'll ever make is, is coming to Jesus. The greatest uh, relationship you will ever have uh, is the one that you'll have with Jesus Christ. This is a, a, a God who loves you so much that he came to this earth to die on a cross for you. To have his body be beat and broken and his blood shed to cover your sin so that you could be redeemed. So if you don't know Jesus, uh, this is a great time to do that. Send me a message, text me, email me, um, hit that uh, contact link on Facebook. I would love to walk you through that. Uh, maybe through this uh, uh, sermon time, um, you prayed that prayer to have God search you and that opened up a whole can of worms and, and there's a lot of stuff going on there um, that you need to talk about, you need to unpack. Um, I would love nothing more uh, than to do that with you. Uh, feel free to shoot me a message. Uh, you know we can. You know we can talk on the phone. We can text, email. We can zoom. Uh, do a video call. We can do anything. I would love nothing more uh, than to walk through that with you. Uh, a couple more announcements. Uh, we have our online Bible study uh, every morning, except for Sundays at 10 o'clock. Um, we're going through the Book of Romans. We're on Romans chapter 11. Um, and so far, it's been a, a, a great study, uh, so I want to invite you to do that. If you've, if you've never, like I said, if you've never done it before, uh, you know, start at the beginning and go through there. Um, and then also we have our online giving. You can go uh, give at bcc.org um, or bordenchurchofchrist.org. I don't know why I always get the website wrong. Bordenchurchofchrist.org, uh, and you can get that uh, set up there, or you can contact me, contact Nick, uh, and we'll get you all set up on that. So um, until next week, guys, uh, uh, God bless you. Stay safe. Keep your hands clean. Uh, Stay inside, stay healthy. Uh, we miss you guys so very much, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Uh, God bless.